Welcome to Creekside. We love to praise and worship 
and make a joyful noise to the Lord. So we're glad that you're here. Welcome, welcome home to Creekside. My name is Stephen. I'm one of the ministers here. And last week, I want to give you a little update. Last week, our sermon was about why Bible. We had ordered 100 Bibles. Every single one of those Bibles left the building last week. Amen, yeah. And uh, they're in the hands of people, and we are praying that they get into the hearts of people. And as a church, we keep as a priority God's word as we hold it out in front of us. And so as we're singing, as we're giving praise, I want to open our time together from Psalm 150. And it says this, praise the Lord, praise God in his sanctuary, praise him in his mighty heaven. Praise him for his mighty works, praise his unequaled greatness, praise him with a blast of the ram's horn. Praise him with the lyre and harp. Praise him with the tambourine and dancing. I saw some of that, yeah. Praise him with the strings and flutes. Praise him with a clash of cymbals. Praise him with loud clanging cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Amen, right? Yeah. You know, and I love the way that the psalmist writes that because, it, you know, we're all expected then. As far as I can tell, everyone here in this room has breath, has a pulse that you woke up today and God said, let there be life in this person. And we pray that you find life and hope here today in the message of God's word. I also want you to listen in Psalm 122, two specific verses this morning. It says, pray for the peace of of Jerusalem. May those who love you be secure. May there be peace within your walls and security within your citadels. You know, we want to be not so closed-minded to recognize we have brothers and sisters in the faith that live in Israel, that live in the Middle East, in the Gaza Strip, all around the world who are under attack for their faith, who literally are experiencing war and are experiencing loss and hurt. And so this morning, as we worship, we do so recognizing the true freedom we have in Christ, that we are called by God's word to pray and to pray for one another and to pray for the peace, the kind of peace that only Christ can bring into this world. And so we are going to make a joyful noise. We're going to praise him with song and with music and with hearts sold out for Jesus Christ not ignorant and not unawares of what is going on in the world around us and that there is mighty power in prayer. We believe that through prayer that God's protection and provision are possible. Do you believe that God goes before us today? Do you believe that his plan is sovereign and perfect? Amen. Then we still have hope, church, and our brothers and sisters around the world today who are waking up scared, who don't know what the day is going to hold, need our prayers and covet our prayers. And so let's do that. Let's not just talk about it. Let's do it. And let's do it together now. Would you bow your heads with me today? Almighty God and Heavenly Father, we thank you that you go before us, that you are a mighty fortress that cannot be shaken or moved. We praise you for the amazing things that you have done and are doing and will do. Let everything that has breath praise you, O Lord. Our hearts are with our brothers and sisters in, in Israel, in the Gaza Strip, in the Middle East, and around the world. People who might not look like us or speak the same language of us, but have the same hope in you. For those that are defenseless, men, women, and children, we pray for their protection, Lord. Lord, we pray for avenues and ways that they would hear the message of Jesus Christ and that your peace would reign in their hearts today. God, we thank you for the amazing God you are. I pray for the, the unseen war that is raging in the hearts of everyone in this room, that there is an enemy that prowls around like a lion waiting to devour us, but Lord, we serve a more amazing and powerful and mighty God than that. The victory has already been won and secured. That is why we celebrate. That is why we sing and make music, and Lord, we are believing that for the person that's here today who is weary, that you can give them rest. For the person that is wrestling with addiction, you can give them true freedom. For the person that hasn't felt true love in years and years and years would feel that in this place through your people today. For the person that doesn't know where their rent or their mortgage is going to come from this week, Lord, that you would show up in an incredible way. God, we believe in what you are doing, and that is why we are here. So God, I pray that our praise would bring you glory, that your name would be the name of all names, 
and that every tongue would confess and knee would bow and say, Jesus Christ is Lord on heaven and earth. Amen and amen. amen. Let's worship the Lord and give him praise today. Amen. Man, are you guys ready to praise the Lord this morning? And I tell you what, we can declare that we know who the battle belongs to. Amen. our Heavenly Father. I 
I am holding on to faith Cause I know you'll make a way I don't always understand I don't always get to see But I will believe it Yes, I will believe it Come on, y'all You make mountains move you make giants fall. You use songs of praise to shake bricks and walls. And I will speak to my fear. I will preach to my doubt. You were faithful then. You'll be faithful Turn to your neighbor, give them a high five, give them a fist bump, say you're happy they're here this morning. Come on.
All right, you guys may be seated. Amen. I've been attending Creekside since June of 2023. I was saved at the age of 21, and then life happens. A few decades being in and out of church, never really you know, got involved, got planted. Um, I ran into a guy I work with, and during a conversation, he asked me, how are you doing? And I, you know, went into typical mail mode and, you know, replied like, my teams are great, we're all performing and everything's going well. He stopped me and he said, no, how are you doing? And that just kind of caught me for a second. So we stood there and talked for about five to 10 minutes. And by the time we were done, here's two men standing in cafeteria style, you know, environment about in tears. And it just took, you know, a few minutes of someone stopping, asking me how I'm doing uh, for me to know that God's love is, you know, present and it's there. And a few days later, uh, I found myself coming to Creekside. Almost immediately, I knew it was the place for us. The messaging from the pulpit, straight on point, straight truth. Uh, Pastor Chuck and the team of leaders do a wonderful job of bringing God's Word every Sunday. The kids love the children's ministry. It's a great place to get plugged in. After a few months, I was given an opportunity to join the children's ministry. God has really blessed me with the opportunity to be able to teach third graders. Coming into the classroom, seeing all the smiles, the friendly faces, how the children you know, look up for that word and that nourishment each Sunday is just such a blessing. I've also established some very healthy relationships with some godly men here at Creekside. And those men have been uh, beside me through some of the darkest moments I've faced in you know, the last few years. Uh, they've poured into me. They've helped pour into my marriage. They've attempted to work with me through brokenness by standing on God's word. And they've attempted to help me find uh, God's plan in my life. And I'm thankful for those relationships that I've created. And I'm thankful for the men here at Creekside. And I found myself on Sundays in time of praise and worship with my arms stretched upright in full submission to God in song. And I don't know if there's ever been a time in my life that I've felt that connected within the church. I really look forward to every Sunday I'm here. I can tell you when you walk through the door, I can just see Jesus in every greeter, uh, every person that's serving, uh, the congregation. Uh, he's just in this place and he feels this place uh, every time we have service. I'm Jeff Kane, and I discovered Y Church at Creekside. Well, good morning, church. It is great to be here once again with you this morning. Welcome to all of those of you who are joining us online as well. My name is Chad. I'm one of the ministers here on staff at Creekside, and I am very excited about the series that we are in. Uh, I thought it might actually be worth briefly touching on the history of the Discover series. So we're, we're in this series, and it's uncovering why we believe, and so I thought well, we can discuss a little bit about why the series. Uh, it's a little bonus, we can call it. So I joined staff back in 2022, and the first project I worked on was revamping our membership pathway, if you will. And over the years, it's taken several forms. So Pastor Chuck and I set out to help the folks uh, really connect to Creekside in a meaningful way. And we realized that we wanted to, to answer the questions that they had. But there was also two groups of people. And so the first group of people are folks that are coming here for the very first time to church at all. And they had questions. They wanted to know why Jesus, who Jesus is, and why we worship him. Why we gather here on a Sunday morning and spend time together every week, why there's a tank of water up front. If you're here for the first time, you might wonder what that is about, and why we read from the Bible, okay? And then there are other group of people, they were just coming to see, could Creekside be their new church home? And they had questions. What do we believe about King Jesus? What is our stance on baptism? What do we believe about the Bible? And what kind of church are we? Well, the answers to these questions were all aligned, so we created Discover Creekside, which is a four-part series of discussions around why Jesus, why Bible, why baptism, and why church. And we started those on Sundays actually back in June of 2022. In the beginning, it was great. I got to come in and I got to meet new people, usually one or two a week, sometimes zero. But now, 
hundreds of people have gone through and continue to go through Discover Creekside every year, and they, many of them have come to accept Jesus as Lord and Savior and be baptized, become committed members at Creekside, and even go out and share their faith with their family and friends. It has been so impactful that we wanted to bring it out of the classroom and into the pulpit, so that's exactly what we've done for the last few weeks, and it, I'm just really excited about that. And so... Um, Just to think about what's going on, I want to share this with you. If you've been coming and you're like, this is really good, well, I want you to still come to Discover Creekside. And if you've already been to Discover Creekside, it's not time to get up and and walk out because they're not verbatim, right? They're not exactly the same. In fact, we stopped doing Discover Creekside while we were doing this series. So we'll start that back up again on May 5th at 10 30 in the student center and so I, i'm just i really would love for you to be a part of that if you haven't been through that they are discussion based they're interactive and i think it would actually benefit everyone to be uh, going through those so uh, this series has been great it has helped us understand why we believe what we believe and so with that i want to jump into our next discovery uh, but let's start with a word of prayer father god i want to thank you for these men and women here i want to thank you for our time together and i pray that you're working in everyone's heart to help us understand what it is that is our next step to follow you more deeply. God, we thank you for your son, Jesus. We praise you. We pray all of this in his name. Amen. All right, so Florida. Florida is great, okay? I, you live here, right? I, I got similar reaction out of the first service. Like, you guys live here. You don't think Florida is great? Like, Florida is awesome. So I I actually moved here at the end of 2020, and a common phrase in our household then and still is, is we are living on vacation. Anybody else? Yeah. And so I grew up in western Pennsylvania, and we moved to northern Virginia for quite some time. And both of those places have four distinct seasons. Florida, however, has three at best. So where are my northerners at? Where are my northerners? We had a lot last year. Okay. Yes. Yeah, a lot. All right. So you all understand... You all understand what it's like to have to shovel snow, right? And sometimes you just have to shovel snow just to get to work and to get home. I remember there was a time that I worked and uh, it snowed in the afternoon. We got home. It was very difficult to drive home. And I get home and the snow plow had blocked in my driveway, right? So now here I have to park on the street and get out in my work clothes, go get the snow shovel and shovel out the driveway just to be able to park my car so I can go in change, come back out, and shovel some more, and clear out the mailbox and everything so that I can go to work the next day. I do not miss that at all, okay? Although, I will say I am considering getting a snow shovel again for this weird thing you have here called pollen season. It's, It's like way too much pollen. I don't understand it. Anyway, I digress. There are, because of the weather here, and it's beautiful outside, there are just countless things that we can do, right, outside all year round. There are uh, uh, sports events all year round outside, sports activities. There are countless other outdoor recreational kind of activities that we can do all year round. And then we have the beaches, right? We live on a peninsula. There's beaches everywhere, whole way around us, in fact, right? And then we have world-renowned amusement parks. People travel from all over the world to come to these amusement parks. There is an astounding number of ways we can spend our free time. So, why church? Why gather here and meet on a Sunday morning? Good question. So to answer that, I think it's best that we start with what church is first. So if you open up your Bibles, you can follow along with us in Matthew chapter 16. We'll camp out there for a little bit. And while you get there, I'm going to talk a little history. Uh, I'm a bit of a nerd, and I do more of this in Discover Creekside, so if you're geeking out too when I start this, you can join us over there. That's another reason to come be a part of the Discover Creekside. So the early church in the first couple centuries was still mainly underground, and, and that's how they spread. But then around the 6th century, you start to see an outward appearance of the church, and that's what we would know today as the Catholic Church. That's when they started kind of be more prominent. And the Catholic Church built itself on traditions that helped the church grow and expand. And it was the primary way that Christians worshipped for about the next 900 years. And then the Reformation movement started, right? You might know the name Martin Luther. And the Reformation movement came along and disputed the validity of some of those traditions and created this boom of denominations 
but along with that created divisions and arguments among Christians about which beliefs and traditions were the right ones. And then in the 1800s, there was a movement to restore the church back to the words that God left us in his scripture, Bible-believing, Bible-teaching assemblies. That was called the Restoration Movement. And Creekside is a Restoration Movement church. We like to say we do Bible things in Bible ways. And so with that in mind, what does the Bible say about church? Well, the word in the New Testament, ecclesia, that they use for church is, means called out ones or assembly. And it refers to a group of people then that have been called out of their homes, assembled, typically, to hear some sort of information and then act on it. Okay, but that still doesn't really unify, doesn't really do a whole lot to help us understand what it means to be a church. So let's jump into Matthew 16 and see how it all starts. I think it'll open up our eyes to some things. So verse 13. Now when Jesus came to, into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter replied, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Amen? Amen. It can be really easy to read this, though, and miss the significance of the interaction that just happened between Jesus and Peter. Okay? We're, when we're reading our Bibles and we're reading full chapters a day, and I'm not saying don't do that, but when we're doing that, sometimes we miss little nuances. They just slip past us. So first, this is before Jesus goes to the cross. Okay? Peter is answering this question before he has seen Jesus be betrayed, carry the cross to Calvary, before he saw Jesus willingly die for the disciples' sins, for my sins, for your sins, before redeeming us to God. Peter says this before the empty tomb, before death had been defeated, before experiencing the risen Christ. That's, fan that's just unfathomable that he makes this claim. And right here in verse 18, we see Jesus talk about this rock that he's going to build his church on. Now, some assume this meant Peter because Peter's name literally means rock as well. But the words here in the original language give us some, uh, some more insight to what's going on. So Peter's name, rock, that rock is actually more the kind of rock that you can just pick up, maybe skip across a lake. Okay, just give you some idea of that. But when Jesus says upon this rock, he uses a different word for rock. He uses the word that means foundational boulder, something you can build on. Okay, very different. So then what is this rock he is referring to? Because it's not Peter. No, he's pointing back to the profession that Peter just made, that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of the living God. This is the rock. This is the foundation of the church. Okay. So now that we know that church is a group of people called out of their homes and assembled, and we know that the foundation of the church is a declaration that Jesus is the Christ, then that would mean this isn't the church. It's not, right? The building is not the church. What the text is saying is this is the church. Right? It's these people serving together. And then this is the church. Right? There's even more people coming to faith, and there's prayer. And this is the church. And this is the church. And this is the church. Right here. Say hi, everybody. You are the church. We are the church. Right? The church is the people, not the building. Each and every one of us who has declared Jesus as Lord and Savior are his called out ones, his church. Let that sink in. You are the church. 
And the next very powerful thing that we realize is what we're going to do together. Part of why we gather just like this. Verse 18, I will build my church and what? The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. That's a military hub kind of area. So let's just throw this out here, a little quiz. Is a gate offensive or defensive? Defensive, that's right. The gates of hell aren't attacking us. We, the church, are attacking them. And I can assure you that when just Chad or maybe just Chuck or just Barry goes and rattles the gates, hell is not too concerned about that. But when we go together, unified as a church, making the same confession that Peter did, that Jesus is Lord and Messiah, hell is concerned. And we are assured in Scripture by Jesus himself that those gates will not prevail. They will not hold. So why, church? Because together we will bust through those gates and push back the darkness of this world. When a church is all in, committed to the mission of Jesus, the enemy cannot stand, his defenses fall, he is exposed, lives are changed, people are saved, and heaven looks different. Amen? That's right. So then what does it take? What does it take to be that kind of church, a team, a family of believers, all in and committed to the mission of Jesus? Well, at Creekside, we see six practices that are laid out in Acts 2. So you want to jump over to Acts 2. We're going to start in verse 42 in a moment. And while you get there, this is what the early church did to push back the darkness of this world and bust through those gates. Okay? In verses 14 to 41, just preceding that, Peter is at Pentecost, and he is speaking to everyone in that moment. And he shares the gospel, and they accept Jesus as Lord and Messiah. And it says in verse 41 that about 3,000 that day were saved. And he could have been more. A lot of times they only counted the men in that, so there could have been more than that. So 3,000 plus people were saved, and they started to practice what that meant to, to be the church. And so those actions were recorded then in the following verses, and that's where we're going to pick up, starting in verse 42. All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, that's this, and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, that's communion, and to prayer. A deep sense of awe came over them all, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders, and all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. And they sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. They worshiped together at the temple each day met in homes for the Lord's Supper and shared their meals with great joy and generosity, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day, the Lord added to their fellowship, added to this, those who were being saved. So let's take a look at what we see in there. The first thing we see is that a church that's all in meets together often. Verse 44, they were all meeting together. And even in verse 46, it says they were meeting daily in the temple. I get it. That, that seems a lot. And in fact, they, they did feel that way too. So later, they did start meeting once a week on Sundays. But they had this regular fellowship together in a large group. And some of us still do that today. We still meet here every Sunday. Some of us even twice a week. For others, it's once or twice a month. The building is not the church, but it is where we come for encouragement to bring others onto the team, to share Jesus with others around us. It's where we're re reassured that we're in this together. It's where we take communion and unity together. It's where we pray and we praise together. And dare I say, it's where we even have fun together. There are a lot of things that we could do on Sunday morning. But there are very few that are as important as gathering together. Hebrews 10.25 actually warns us to not neglect meeting together. There is power in this to push back the darkness. I'll share a story with you. At my last church, our campus minister's name is Brennan. 
He's actually several years younger than me, and he was diagnosed with cancer. And not that there's ever a type of cancer that's ever fun, so don't take it that way. But this was one of those even less fun varietals, and we need to kind of leave it at that. Um, but we as a church, we rallied around him and his family. Right? We did, gave him meals, babysat, helped him with chores, prayed over him as a church multiple times, and even anointed him with oil. Halfway through his chemo, just chemo, his doctor tells him something that has never happened in this doctor's career of practicing medicine. It says his tumor has shrunk by 60% on chemo alone. Okay? Never happened. Has no idea how. Well, Brennan knows how. Brennan knows why this is and gets to share in that moment the power of God with the doctor. And then a year into his treatments of chemo and radiation, he's cancer-free. Praise God. That's right. The doctor calls it a miracle because he's never, ever seen this before with this size and stage of tumor. There is tremendous power in this. And I believe in this so much. I didn't grow up in the church. And when I came to Jesus, that was it, right? When we weren't on staff at a church, my wife and I, we're, we're just part of a church. My family planned our vacations from Monday to Saturday. And my children, before they could walk, they were not allowed to participate in sports where there were games and practices on Sunday morning. We are devoted to be here. This is our home. And every Sunday is like a family reunion for us. And we actually like (laughs) y'all. So number two... A church that's all in is in community together. Verses 46 and 47, they were meeting in their homes and enjoying the favor of all the people. So this also means their neighbors around them. And we contextualize this idea here as being in a community group. So if you are not in a community group yet, let me encourage you to find one. You can stop at Next Steps and we can help you with that. These are kind of like the special missions units of the church. They're smaller groups of people that are getting real with one another, and they are pushing back the darkness locally right around them. They're serving, and they're inviting their neighbors into their homes. I get it. The introverts are going to write me some sternly worded emails about this, but the whole point is they're in community with each other, and even if it's a select few right next door, this is part of our mission. This is. And so I mentioned, I wasn't always in church, and neither was my wife. And we were actually living away from our our families when we came to to Christ. And amidst learning how to be followers and even better spouses and eventually parents, the church became our family. They supported us. They brought us meals, visited us in the hospital, mentored us, and even invited us to have community together. And they were, at least in my case, more of a family to me than I ever had. And they still are. They still are. See, we are all broken, and our families are not perfect. And we all need the saving grace of Christ. We need loving families and community, and so do our neighbors. Pushing back that darkness, it could simply look like helping a neighbor with a project, maybe mowing a lawn for a widow, It could be babysitting for a single mom or someone whose spouse is deployed. It could be inviting them to do something fun with you, bringing them a meal, or just inviting them into your home. See, we're all made for community. In fact, one of my friends was doing research for his PhD, and he surveyed 75 people, and he asked the question, what does church mean to you in your life? 73 out of 75 people had the same answer. It was some form of the word, community. We are all desperate. People are desperate for connection and community. And we can give it to them if we are committed to be the church. Number three, a church that's all in serves one another. The whole passage speaks about this, and it's also supported throughout the entire New Testament. Right? Galatians 6 is just one example where it reminds us to do good to all people. It's truly beautiful. Talk about love on display in a way that the evil of this world cannot stand against. And there are plenty of ways we can serve 
together. Some are here. There's actually many available on Sunday mornings and throughout the week. So let me give you just a couple, just kind of give you an idea. There are more and more people coming to Creekside every week. And as I mentioned, they all need Jesus in our lives. We all do. And the thing about this area, if you haven't noticed, is most of the people coming have children. They do. And I don't know if you have children yourselves or if you've toured our children's ministry, but it's great. It really is fantastic. And these wonderful new families are bringing their kids, so there's a need for more volunteers, just like Jeff from our video earlier, right, to step into that ministry so that these families, they can feel loved. And that stress and anxiety and depression and mess of this world can just be, for at least a short time, a little less overwhelming. They can depend on the church to be there and help them through this time, and they can trust that their children are being well cared for and building relationship with Jesus all at the same time. But that's not the only opportunity. That's not the only opportunity. There are countless other ways to get involved, and some are actively pushing back against the darkness in very tangible ways ways. Two of these would be FAM, which is our foster and adoption ministry, and Safe Havens, which you may have seen on campus behind the building here. You know, there are over a thousand children in the foster care system right now in St. John's and Duval County. Now, I realize not everyone is called to be a foster family, but everyone can do something. Creekside currently supports 14 of these families. We wrap our arms around those families, and we help them with meals and other needs, Just this past week, you may have seen in the one slide, Gems Ministry took girls out there to do some much-needed yard work for some of these families. We also collect freezer meals, which you could make and drop off for these families. And we collect donations for items that they need. And then there's an interesting one. And I say it's interesting because it's actually very much the same thing that our schools are asking for. The FAM families would love for godly men and women to get involved in their children's lives, to actually come around and be just a friend to some of these foster children by coming around and reading them a story or playing a game with them on a regular basis, not a one and done, but consistently, they would then start to experience the love that Jesus has for them, that same love that he has for all of you. As this is interesting to you and you want to do this, there's a Coffee and Connect meeting for fam next Sunday where you can learn more. And I mentioned the schools in this. It's very interesting to me that the middle schools in this area, they're asking for the same thing. Adult mentors, very similar to what fam's need is, just adults that can come alongside of some of these middle school students on a consistent basis during the school day. And I know that's what makes it hard, but during the school day to help them in these difficult times in their lives. In the world they're growing up in, It is dark, and it's hopeless, and quite frankly, it's increasingly more evil. But a church that's all in could change the lives of these kids forever. I also mentioned safe havens. What they do is they collect furniture and household items, and then they go out and they furnish about one home a week for families going through some of their darkest days, like refugees needing additional assistance, homeless families that are trying to get back on track, or even other darker situations where people are transitioning back to permanent housing from shelters. These ministries are walking up to the gates of hell, and they are kicking them down in the name of Jesus. And we can be a part of that. So number four, a church that's all in reads their Bibles. Okay? Verse 42, they were devoted to the apostles' teachings which Pastor Chuck talked about last week, the Bible changes lives. There is proof that being in the Scriptures four days a week or more has a significant impact on key areas of our lives. And I get it. If you're not there yet, that could could be a challenge. Let me me share this, because anybody that started a new habit from scratch knows if you're going to say four and you choose four, you're probably going to get to like one or two. So that's being honest. So here's what I like to tell people. It's what I share. Shoot for seven, hit five. Shoot for seven days a week in the Bible and hit five. You've still got a buffer. You're still in the Word four days a week or more, and we know that that changes your life and the lives of those around you. Number five, a church that's all in gives generously. Verse 44 through 46 clearly shows they had generosity with one another. And this one gets some flack from time to time, so let me explain. 
Every good and perfect gift is from God. His bless, he's blessing us with resources so when we give back to the kingdom, we are helping to bring Jesus to folks that are living in or just escaping the darkness. And this brings all the glory to Jesus. Don't miss that. We give to bring the glory to Jesus, not ourselves. So when someone says that they're all in, what we typically see is they move to the next level of giving. Let me explain. Easy way to look at this is if you are currently giving nothing to kingdom-minded causes, to places, to organizations that are actively pushing back that darkness, then start giving something. And if you're already giving something, then tithe. That's, that's the 10% we talk about. And if you're already tithing, Jesus remarks about giving sacrificially. So consider that. Now, <clears throat> to give you context, because I think, I think sometimes we can miss the vision that could be out there, I just want to share what's possible. We all we know approximately how many families come to Creekside. We, we do know that. And there is publicly available data that shows the area that we live in and can give us an idea of what 10% of the yearly earnings of a church this size would be. And if we were all tithing to Creekside, so one, one cause, the math suggests we would be able to fund planting a church a year. One new church a year could be planted. Or we could do something like adopt schools, and we could give them their school supplies. And I don't mean a class. I mean a whole school and more than one. That's possible. Just think of the impact that we could have on refugees or homelessness or a variety of other needs locally and globally, some right here in this church. In fact, the majority of our benevolence fund goes to members here in significant need. But let me say this. If this excites you and you're like, yeah, but I'm not sure about Creekside yet, that's okay. At least be generous towards kingdom-minded causes. What we talked about, those ones that are actively sharing the gospel and pressing back on that evil, that darkness, every day. And we'll even suggest a few if you come see us. The reality is this is about the kingdom and God. And he loves a cheerful giver. Number six, a church that's all in prays daily. Back to verse 42, they were devoted to prayer. Why? Prayer works. That's why. In fact, my PhD friend I mentioned, he was looking into a quantum neuroscience study. It's not nerdy at all. And it showed people in a hospital, right? So they had, they had a hospital, and they have some people over here, and then there's other people in another area of the hospital, and they're kind of, they want to see the effects of prayer. So they put little monitors on them to monitor their brain waves, and these folks don't know. So the ones that are getting prayer, they have no idea what's going to happen. They're just monitoring brain waves. And they ask this other group of people to start praying for these people, and their alpha waves go off at the same time. Science is starting to show how God has designed us. It's starting to prove these things. So we know prayer works. Even if we don't fully understand it, we know that it works. And a church that is committed to Jesus prays daily. And this is not like the Bible one. This is a shoot for seven, hit seven. Pray every day. In fact, we even have a tool that we use that's really helpful in reminding us to pray for our neighbors. It's called Bless Every Home. It's free for you to join. You can scan the QR code or you can stop by Next Steps. We have some of the decals over there set up so we can help you connect. And they give you a reminder, a prayer prompt every day for five households near you to pray for. And since Creekside began using this in 2022, this church, meaning all of, all of you, have prayed for homes over 82,000 times. So if we can see the red number up there, that's how many prayers. And then you can see some other numbers here too. Uh, it does an absolutely great way of tracking these other things. But the point in this is to share how powerful prayer is. There have been multiple stories, multiple stories in the church of various people sharing with us that they're praying for their neighbors by name because that's what the app does. And then they're at church and they either meet someone or they get told like, oh, did you, did you meet so-and-so? And they're going, how do I know this name? How do I know this name? It's people they've never met, but they've been praying for by name in their own neighborhoods. And they're coming to Creekside for the first time. There is power in our prayers. Don't miss that. 
All we're doing with these six practices is contextualizing what the early church was doing to press back against that darkness and live out the mission of Jesus. And we can be a part of this. We can do it too if we choose to. Next week is actually a decision day here at Creekside. And we're praying that all of you, that's a bold prayer, but we know God can do it, that all of you come and begin or renew your relationship with Jesus and his church. Now, for some of you, that starts with repenting and being baptized, accepting Jesus as Lord and Savior. We just had a young girl, Evelyn, do that very thing a little bit ago. Be filled with the Holy Spirit and be on mission. And then after baptism, the next step is to become a member here at Creekside, declaring that you're all in with us as we bust through those gates of hell together. And even if you've been the member for some time, we're still going to invite you to renew your commitment and declare that you are still with us as we push back the darkness and evil of this world. Just imagine all of us right now, just, if you could just kind of mind's eye, think about this. Everyone at Creekside, all of us, if we were unified together and we declared that we are on mission with Jesus, the beauty and the power of that, all of us together. Now, if you want, you can tap the seat back in front of you with your phone, and it has a link that'll take you to our covenant. You could also text church to the number on the screen, and you'll get a digital version of that, so you can review it. I get it. I'd, I'd like to review things myself, so you can get a digital copy this week, and you can review it. And here's your I will statement for the week that I will pray about beginning or renewing my commitment to Jesus and his church. Next week, our hope and our prayer is that you will come ready to do just that, that you will begin or renew your commitment to Jesus and his church. Everything that we have talked about today grows us more and more to be like Christ, to be little Christ, Christians, think disciples, People grow through habits and commitments, and nothing that we've discussed today is complicated, but it does take devotion, a devotion to a higher purpose more than ourselves, and the purpose to be in unity, be little Christ, taking Jesus, being those disciples that take Jesus into the darkness and push it back day by day through meeting together, being in community and groups together, serving on teams, together. Reading our Bible often together and praying every day together. See, together, committed and all in, we will bust down a gate, a wall, a fortress. It doesn't matter. Together, we will win the world with Jesus. Amen? Yes. Yes, church. I want to leave you with this quote from C.S. Lewis about the church as you go this week. The church exists for nothing else but to draw men and women into Christ, to make them little Christ disciples. If they are not doing that, then all the cathedrals, the buildings, all right, the clergy, the pastoral staff, the sermon messages, the missions, even the Bible itself are simply a waste of time. God became man. He became Jesus for no other purpose. Let's pray. Father God, we want to lift up this room to you, God, of these men and these women as they leave here as the church, as your church, your called out ones, that they actively are pushing back the darkness of this world. They're busting through the gates, that you're giving them the power, the perseverance, the wisdom, the discernment, everything that they need every day to enter into that, to step into that, to not pull back, to not be afraid, but to press into some of those darkest areas of this world for you, to bring your light, your sun to them, the good news, and to help them realize there is hope in this world. God, we thank you that you gave up your son for us and that through that we have this power. 
We pray this in his name. Amen. Amen. You know, right now, we have an incredible opportunity, just like we're talking about, to come together in communion, which is partly how we get the word community. This is something we're doing together. And as we step into this time, we're reminded of Jesus' sacrifice, his death, burial, resurrection, and his promise to one day come back again. And so that piece of bread and that cup of juice remind us of his body and blood poured out for us on the cross, that God became man in Jesus Christ. And if you came in today and you didn't get a chance to pick those up on the tables, just raise your hand right now. We've got several ushers in the room that can bring those to you. So if you need some, just raise your hand. If you're worshiping at home today and want to get some crackers or juice or something together so you can partake with us as well, we would love for you to do that. You know, this simple but small meal, which is so significant, literally traces us back. You heard some of church history just earlier today. All the way back, though, to that supper, to the first disciples, the followers, the little Christs of Jesus, and it connects us to Jesus himself. And what a beautiful picture we have of the gospel right here in the smallest of ways. And so our challenge, our encouragement to you is if you're a believer here today, we'd love for you to partake in this meal and to remember Christ's sacrifice, to spend some time in prayer. And when you're ready, to take and eat, take and drink, and remember the body and blood of Jesus. And we'll close in prayer in just a few moments. So let's take some time to remember. Almighty God, we thank you for your son Jesus, our Lord and Savior, and this remembrance that we can take part in, communion. Thank you for your church, Lord, your bride, that we are privileged to be a part of. Thank you for community, for the people around us in this room that point us back to you, to the hope that we have in you. And we do pray, I pray for in the next few moments as we respond to the truths that have been presented today, that if there are any gates of Hades built up around the hearts in this room, that they would come crashing down as we march forward together, that you would inhabit the praise of your people, that those Jericho walls would come down at the sound of the praise of your people. Move in this place, Lord, we pray. We believe in your power and your might to do incredible things transform us, Lord. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Each week we want to give you the opportunity to respond to the gospel, okay? And we do that through three ways. And the first of that is to pray. There might be a few things you need to pray about today. You've heard, a, uh, you know, we mentioned next week, decision day. We want you to be praying about that decision to begin or renew a relationship with Jesus and his church. And so you heard about the the membership covenant that you can tap the stickers and the chairs in front of you. And we have some hard copies of those things on on the way out too. But there are resources in that link that tell you about our beliefs and our core values and and our doctrine. And we want you to make an informed and prayer-filled decision about next week. So please take the time to read that. If you need help finding that, come to us, visit us at Next Steps. We'd love to talk to you about that too. But maybe you just need to pray. You know, first service, we had several families and folks come down and kneel on these benches and just spend some time, some honest, authentic time with the Lord. That's why they're here. We've got prayer partners that'll be up front here as well. If you need someone to talk to or pray with you, to pray over you. And maybe you've been challenged today. You heard in the message about giving, to give generously. 
And there's ways to do that right up front in these boxes or boxes on the walls in the back or as, as well as online. Uh, and so we invite you to do that, to worship God through giving and giving generously. But we all are going to respond together in this moment through singing. We're going to sing a few songs. We encourage you to pray, to spend time with God, and that let everything that has breath praise the Lord. So let's stand and let's respond together today, church. Let's worship.
This is my surrender. This is my surrender. And here is where I lay it down. You are all I'm chasing now. This is my surrender. My words will show I've got nothing to lose. How could I express all my love? Come on, y'all, sing now. I could sing this song as I often do. Every song I stay. Sing it out, church. So I throw up my hands, praise you again and again. So all that I have is a hallelujah, hallelujah. And I know it's not much, I'm nothing else before the King, except for hearts in Hallelujah, Hallelujah. I've got one response. I've got just one door. In my arms stretch wide. Except for a heart singing hallelujah. 
Heavenly Father, Lord, we're just so glad to be in your house. We're so glad that you give us a voice like a lion. Lord, let us go out this week. Let us realize that we are the church. And we will go out and we will shake and rattle the gates of hell. And we will praise you. This we pray in your name. Amen. Y'all be blessed.